Former de facto president of Bolivia, Janine Añez, and two of her ministers have been sentenced to four months of pretrial detention. Italy entered on Monday into an almost complete lockdown as COVID-19 cases continue to rise due to the new clusters of highly contagious virus variants. And on Monday, bomb attack against a minibus transporting civilian wounds 15 a day after separate bombings in western Kabul killed three people and wounded 12. Hello and welcome to Telesur English. I am Estefania Bravo from the headquarters of Quito in Ecuador. This is From the South. Former de facto president of Bolivia, Janine Añez, was sentenced to four months pre-trial detention after she was arrested on charges linked to the ousting of former Bolivian President Evo Morales. In an indictment, prosecutors had originally asked for Añez and two ministers in her year-long de facto government to be held for six months as a precautionary measure. Also arrested on Saturday were Añez's former energy minister, Rodrigo Guzman, and his justice counterpart, Álvaro Coimbra. On Sunday, right-wing civilian activist Yacir Molina, who the government said led a group participating in the 2019 protests against Evo Morales, was also arrested. The National Electoral Council announced the official results of the, of the primary elections in Honduras. According to surveys carried out by different media outlets, the presidential candidate Xiomara Castro from the Liberty and Refoundation Party Libre, Yanni Rosenthal from the Liberal Party PL, and Nadri Azrufa from the National Party PN are the most likely winners of the primary elections held this Sunday. The president of the National Electoral Council, or the CNE, Ana Paola Hall, reported that the official results from the primary elections will be used to choose the candidates participating in the general elections on November 28th. Paraguayan authorities announced new restrictions to face COVID-19 for the next few days. Among the measures are the suspension of on-site classes and traffic restrictions between 8 p.m. and 5 a.m. in 24 cities of the so-called Red So, particularly in the city of Asuncion. The restrictions will be enforced from Thursday, March 18th to Sunday, April 4th, as decreed this Sunday by the presidency of Paraguay. According to the last balance issued, the South American country registered 175,827 cases and 3,456 fatalities due to COVID-19. And we, we remain in Paraguay because opposition deputies in charge of drafting the indictment against Paraguayan President Mario Abdo Benitez and Vice President Hugo Velasquez will present this Monday the drafts of two accusatory documents to all deputies. The announcement coincides with the demonstrations and the announcement of a campesino contingent demonstration that will arrive in the Paraguayan capital in support of the impeachment request. The liberals of the four benches totaling 29 deputies and in favor favor of the impeachment. With the rest of the opposition deputies, there are 37 who would vote in favor, although 53 votes are needed to push for the impeachment. The contentious Electoral Tribunal of Ecuador rejected the appeal filed by the presidential candidate of the Pachacutic Party, Yacu Perez, who alleged electoral fraud that allegedly affected his vote in the elections of last February 7th. With this decision of the TCE, it was ratified the celebration of the second electoral round on April 11th between Andres, Andres Arauz, the candidate for the Union for Hope Coalition, and Guillermo Lasso of the Creo PSC Coalition. Perez requested the TCE a recount of votes in 28,000 tally sheets, claiming that he would prove he won the second place in the elections and also surpass a right-wing candidate, Guillermo Lasso. However, the TCE plenary unanimously denied the request of the representative of the Pachacutic party. The electoral campaign for the April 11th runoff election in Ecuador will begin next Tuesday.
We're taking a very short break now. Join us again after this. And also, don't forget to follow me on my Twitter account at Ibravo Telesur for more news. Stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. More news now. On Monday, Italy went into an almost a complete lockdown as well as regions except for Sardinia are in either orange or red zones. Rome is red, meaning all schools are closed except for those students with disabilities and all non-essential shops and restaurants are also shut down. Last fall, the health ministry developed a tired scale of restrictions classifying individual regions on a weekly basis based on their infection rates, hospital capacity, and other criteria. Until recently, only a few hard-hit regions were under full lockdown, but new clusters of highly contagious virus variants have meant more and more regions have passed into the tightest red zone uh, restrictions. The lockdown will be enforced through April 6, including Easter weekend when it will include the entire national territory. On Monday, Georgia launched its COVID-19 vaccination campaign, being the last European country to roll out COVID-19 vaccines. Georgia received over 43,000 doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine through, through the COVAX program. At the first stage, health workers will receive the vaccine. Georgia, with a population of 3.7 million, hopes to vaccinate 60% of the population within this year. Georgia is expecting to receive a second batch of 87,000 vaccines in April. The country is also negotiating with China to receive the Sinovac vaccine. This is important for our country. Consider that today marks the beginning of the elimination of the pandemic in Georgia. The vaccination has over 200 years of history and millions of people have been saved. Therefore, I call upon my colleagues as they are leaders in the treatment of patients. They should be leaders in vaccinations too. In Belgium, restaurant owners and workers in Brussels called for an end to the coronavirus lockdown as their industry continues to suffer. Rallying in front of the Atonium Monument on Monday, they banged pots and pans while letting off flares. Restauranter Alfilio Morina and his colleagues attended the protest dressed up like prisoners and demanded the reopening of the restaurants. Nightclub owners are also suffering financially because they have to close at 10 p.m. just when business normally starts. The slow speed of the vaccine rollout is wearing down business owners who are eager to reopen. To date, the country registers over 808,000 COVID-19 cases and more than 22,000 deaths. Belgium has one of the highest infection rates per number of inhabitants in Europe. I'm here with my whole team, so we've been in prison for a year now. That's why we are dressed up like this. We are calling out this injustice today because our Prime Minister, Alexander de Croo, tells us all together we are strong in Belgium. But we realize that with the different regions in Belgium, we are not all equal. The message I want to give our ministers is that you must ensure all sectors of Belgium come out of this health crisis. For all the sectors, not just Horeca, we cannot cry anymore. German Chancellor Angela Merkel's center-right party has suffered a heavy loss in two key regional elections. According to preliminary results, Merkel's center-right Christian Democratic Union, or CDU, is on track to score its worst-ever results in the southwestern states of Baden-Württemberg and Rhineland-Palatine. In a wealthy Baden-Württemberg, the CDU got 23%, while the Green Party held on the first place, getting more than 31% of the votes. In neighboring Rhineland, Land Palatine, the CDU placed second with 25 and 26 percent of the votes, while the center left SPD held on to the first place at 33.34 percent.
Beijing has seen its skies turn orange by a thick yellow smog on Monday with pollution surging to hazardous levels as a sandstorm swept across China's capital. According to local media outlets, the poor air quality was due to a sandstorm from northern Mongolia carried south by the wind and also reducing visibility in Beijing to less than 1,000 meters. The city government ordered all schools to cancel outside sports and events and advised those with respiratory diseases to stay inside. Residents use goggles, masks, and hair nets to protect themselves from the choking air with landmarks including the Forbidden City and the distinctive headquarters of the state broadcaster CCTV, partially obscured behind an apocalyptic looking pall of smog. I feel every breath of air will give me lung problems. I think I saw it several years ago, but I haven't seen anything like this in recent years. I remember back in the 90s, when I was still in primary school, between every winter and spring, Beijing would be covering a sandstorm, and back then the sky looked yellower than it is now. Sometimes when it rained, my coat was splashed with mud. We're taking one last short break, don't go away. A bomb targeting a minibus in Afghanistan's capital exploded on Monday, wounding at least 15 civilians. Ferdras Farmar, spokesperson for the Kabul police chief, said the minibus was attacked in the Dahan Ebak area. The spokesman added that casualty could also rise. The attack comes a day after separate bombings of vehicles in the western part of Kabul killed three people and wounded 12. Paramars said an investigation was ongoing, but all the casualties were civilians. No one immediately claimed responsibility for any of the attacks on Sunday and on Monday. Afghanistan is experiencing a nationwide spike in bombings, targeting killings and other violence as peace negotiations take a tar between the Taliban and the Afghan government continue. I was on the way home from the office when the explosion happened. I turned my face and saw a co-star was the target. The victims were crying and they were in critical conditions. In Myanmar, hundreds of protesters returned to the streets of Mandalay on Monday despite an ever-growing use of lethal force by security forces. Demonstrators split up into smaller groups and kept their demonstrations brief to try to reduce the livelihood of being caught by the police or army. On Sunday, at least one person, a young woman, was shot dead in the city and a number of others suffered gunshot wounds. Nationally, at least 38 people were killed on Sunday and dozens were injured in one of the deadliest days of the crackdown. Most of those killed were in Yangon, the country's largest city. Myanmar's ruling junta has declared martial law in parts of Yangon. And also on Monday, Myanmar protesters held marchers in Dawei, overcoming fears that security forces might respond with lethal force. Groups of demonstrators marched early in the morning and again in the afternoon, calling for the military junta to stand down and for the release of the country's detained civilian leaders. The southern city has become a hotspot of resistance to the February 1st military takeover. China said on Monday it was very concerned for the safety of its citizens in Myanmar after several Chinese factories were attacked amid a bloody crackdown on pro-democracy protests in Yangon. China is closely following the development of the situation in Myanmar and is very concerned about the impact on the safety of Chinese institutions and personnel. China hopes Myanmar will take practical measures to ensure the safety of Chinese citizens and resolutely avoid a recurrence of such incidents. We hope all parties in Myanmar can keep calm and restrained. This is in the fundamental interest of Myanmar people, resolving disputes and differences through dialogue and consultation within the constitutional and legal framework will continue to push forward the democratic process in the country. Top priority now is to prevent further conflicts and bloodshed and ease tensions as soon as possible. 
On Monday, Ugandan opposition leader Bobby Wine was arrested as he took part in a protest in Kampala. The 39-year-old pop star turned presidential contender had called last week on Ugandans to rise up peacefully and unarmed against uh, President Yoweri Museveni, who won a sixth term in office following disputed elections in January. Several activists from Wine's National Unity Platform political party wearing business suits and red ties took part in the brief protest, which was quickly halted by police officers and soldiers. Wine, whose real name is Robert Caguliani, was first taken to a police station after being driven in a police vehicle to his home outside Kampala, which is now surrounded by police and the military, according to a post on his Twitter account. Wine was demanding the release of hundreds of his supporters he claimed were abducted by security forces since the start of the presidential election campaign late last year. We are non-violent. We want our people back. We want our you people. kidnap the people of Uganda. They are being tortured. They are being murdered. We are non-violent. And we yeah, demand yeah. of you to respect the law. We demand of you, police, military, all security authorities, we demand of you to respect the right to life of the people of Uganda. We are non-violent. We are protesting against the injustice. This Monday, Libya's new interim Prime Minister Abdul Hamid Debeba sworn to lead the war-torn country's transition to elections in December after years of chaos and division. The North African nation descended into conflict after Muammar Gaddafi uh, was toppled and killed in a NATO-backed uprising in 2011, resulting in multiple forces vying for power. Debeba selected a UN-sponsored talks in February alongside an interim three-member presidency council was due to take the oath of office in the eastern city of Tobruk. The Beba's swearing in comes after Parliament last week approved his cabinet in a move hailed by key leaders and foreign powers as historic. His government includes two deputy prime ministers, 26 ministers, and six ministers of state, with five posts including the key foreign affairs and justice portfolios handed to women, a first in Libya. I swear to God that I will perform my work duties with all honesty and loyalty and always remain loyal to the objective of the February 17th revolution, to respect the constitution and the constitutional declaration and to protect the interests of the Libyan people. And with that story, we've come to the end of this news brief, but remember you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesorenglish.net. And also, don't forget to follow us on our social media accounts. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram as well. For Telesur English, I am Estefania Bravo. See you next time.